Ron, thank you for joining us today. And uh, as we've told so many other people, what we'd like to do is talk to you about uh, living, working, and playing in Redondo Beach from the time that you first came here um, until today. And we'd like to hear the history as you saw it. Uh, um, and if you could just start by telling us when you were born, uh, when you came to Redondo Beach for the first time, and uh, go on from there. OK. Well, I came here in the beginning. I was born in Torrance Hospital, the old Torrance Hospital, which is no longer exists. It used to be downtown Torrance in 1936, and uh, lived in Redondo Beach most of my life. Went to the Redondo School System, the South School in Redondo Beach. Grew up actually on the, in the 200 block of Avenue D in Redondo. Went to the uh, South School, the old South School. The site's still there, but the building's gone. <laughs> and uh, Redondo High School. And uh, actually, my parents, uh, they were, they came here. My dad came here in 1911, I believe. Or no, 1915. And uh, so he's been here. Our family's been here a long time. My mother, uh, they got married uh, in 35. And... Uh, in the Methodist Church in Redondo on the corner of Bro uh, Torrance Boulevard and Broadway with the same church that Norma and I were married. And uh, our kid, one of our kids, or two of our kids are married there, actually. And uh, so, you know, we have a lot of history of Redondo. Uh, my dad started out in 1933 as a grave digger at Pacific Crest Cemetery in Redondo Beach way out in the sticks. And when I was a kid, I remember I used to go out there and hunt anything that moved with my BB gun and my 22 back in those days. You know, there was nothing you could hit that would hurt anybody. It was out in the Thule's, out in the, out in the uh, oh, probably, uh, I guess, sand dunes, you'd call it more or less. That was about all that was out there. Uh, I'm trying to think of... My dad actually started uh, in Redondo Beach. He went to, my parents, both my parents went to Redondo High School. Both my enormous parents, my wife's parents went to Redondo High School. And uh, so there's uh, a lot of stuff we remember, a lot of stuff we've forgotten too, probably. <laughs> well, one of the things that we've heard about is that, I'm not sure if it was your father or your grandfather, but uh, there was somebody in the Day family that owned a, mar a small market or a candy store at the corner of Burl, somewhere near the corner of Burl and Broadway. That's correct. It was my father's parents. On a, uh, my, my grandmother on my dad's side, his mother, was very active in that Methodist church, the same one we're talking about. And his dad uh, ran the grocery store, a little grocery store, which was right kind of part of the house. A lot of times back in those days, they, they lived there at that location, but the front part of the of the building was actually a grocery store. And do you remember what the address was there? And if it, is, it, is the building still there today? The building's not there, no. I don't remember the address, but it was on the, about the, nor, uh, no, southwest corner of Burl and Broadway. Is about where it was. And did you ever go to the store? Not that I recall. I, I, I don't recall that. I, in fact, I don't know for sure they still had. They still had the house, but I don't think the store was operating when I was a kid. So, uh, you lived on Avenue D, and we've spoken with some people that say, if you lived in South Redondo at that time, you seldom got north of Knob Hill or uh, north of 190th at least or whatever. <laughs> north of 190th was a long ways away, that's right. right. Yeah, well, you know, you spent a lot of time going to, walking down to the beach and on the beach. And uh, uh, and when I actually, I can recall going to South School there, which was on the corner of, which is on Prospect, I mean, uh, Torrance Knob Hill, Pacific yeah. Coast Highway between Knob Hill and Avenue A. Um, I never did have to walk on the sidewalk. I just leave the house and walk through vacant lots straight through to the to the school. I mean, there was a lot of open land, you know, at that point. A little different than now, <laughs> just now, a little. You lived at two sixteen Avenue D. That's correct. And is that house still there today? In two thousand. Yes, it is. 
my parents bought that house on 216 Avenue Duty. I can recall my dad saying that they bought that house in 19, about 38 or so. They paid 30, was it what? They built it. They, well, I guess maybe they built it, yeah. But anyway, they had it built and and they paid $3,650. And that was the house, the lot, and the whole thing, you know. So built on the lot, on the, $3,650. Uh, yeah, including the lot cost. Yeah. And how big was the house at that time? Oh, it was not that large. It was probably uh, 12, 1,300 square feet at that time, but it got expanded over the years. And of course, now it's even bigger, but uh, it's still there. The, the house hasn't been, you know, torn down and a big building put up there, although many houses on that block have been, but not, not this one. In you were born in 1936, so in 1941 you would have been about five years old. What year did you start at South School? I went to kindergarten there, which would have been probably in 1940 or so, 41 maybe. Uh, and actually uh, my aunt was the kindergarten teacher and, uh, at that school, Frances Depew. And uh, the first thing I remember her telling me is, you can't call me Auntie Francis anymore. You have to call me Mrs. Depew. So I had to toe the mark there for that year. <laughs> now, the, we, we have had people tell us about Mrs. Depew. Oh, yeah. As remembering them as their first teacher. Yeah. The oh, name yeah. is familiar. Oh, yeah. She was here. She taught quite a few years. And, uh, and basically, she was a kindergarten teacher most all that time. She may have taught a, another class or two uh, off and on, but not very, most of it was uh, kindergarten. Now, in December of 1941, obviously that's when Pearl Harbor occurred, and we've heard about, <coughs> um, a Jap we heard from one person about a Japanese submarine um, coming up on Christmas Day, or they believed it came up on Christmas Day, 1941. Do you have any recollection of your parents talking about that, or the newspapers, or really what recollection do you have of Redondo Beach during the war? Well, uh, re recollection of the submarine, there were just kind of rumors and so forth. I never saw anything. Uh, we had a, there was an anti-aircraft uh, battery down where the old Riviera Country Club used to be on the end of Avenue, uh, end of Catalina and Avenue, or, uh, yeah, Avenue I or so, right in there. And every once in a while, they, you know, they'd be firing up, they'd be shooting down Japanese airplanes, you know. <laughs> of course, the only thing we found in our backyard was a bunch of shrapnel from the shells, but <laughs> there never was anything that, as far as I know, that they were, you know, it was all panic stuff. But there was uh, apparently a, a submarine surfaced off there, offshore. There was one that I know surfaced off Santa Barbara because my uncle lives there in Santa Barbara and fired into some oil tanks in Santa Barbara. But um, periodically, uh, most of uh, what I remember about World War II was uh, the anti-aircraft batteries uh, scaring the devil out of us at night when they went off. And we thought for sure, you know, the, here they come, you know, they're going to bomb us, you know. <laughs> but it never happened, of course. Now, they told us that there was, I actually looked it up on the Internet, too, there was a, a battalion, um, an artillery battalion that was on Torrance Beach pretty much from where the Riviera Beach Club was at, um, it's like Vista Del Mar and Esplanade. Now, did you go down as a little boy and look at the cannons? Did your parents take you Well, I, if I recall correctly, I thought the uh, that same um, uh, anti-aircraft uh, group was not on the beach. It was up above where the old, or where the Riviera, uh, I guess it was a country club or Riviera, pool and everything was there. It was right around there. I don't recall that it was on the beach, but it could have been. But that was all kind of off limits. You couldn't get, you know, they, they wouldn't let you get close to that. I remember uh, finding uh, parts of a, of a, uh, of an anti-aircraft target drone that had, had, uh, they'd fly little airplanes and they'd shoot at those and try to knock those down. A little, little target kind of free-flying airplane. had some radios in them, I guess, because I remember they said little tiny tubes, and we'd never seen these little tiny tubes before. And that we always seen these great big, you know, tubes that were that high, but these were little tiny ones, new things, you know, very 
hush hush stuff, you know. <laughs> in in 1941, say to 1945, you would have been about um, five to ten years old. Did your parents or you go to the down to the boardwalk in the pier area? Oh sure, Moon Moonstone Beach, and we used to go uh, walk walk along there. It was very nice. And uh, as a kid, I used to go to the theater, the Strand Theater, and the Fox Theater, and we'd see the the Saturday matinees, and they'd show the short, short subject, you know, at noon about hop along Cassidy or whatever, you know, bring you back next week to find out what happened to him, you know, that kind of th series. That, and uh, uh, yeah, that's that's. We used to go uh, down to Redonda Beach. We used to walk down through the central part of Redonda, which used to be a, a, an old a town of Redonda Beach before the harbor was built. And uh, my wife's uh, uh, parents or in-laws or some of hers had a store, a radio service there. Dave Blasey had the radio service store there. And a lot of other stores down there, old Redondo, uh, that uh, Tommy Bowman had the D and D drugstore uh, on the corner, uh, and, uh, which, as I understand, most of the city planning was done in the back room of the D and D drugstore <laughs> before the council meeting. <laughs> Well, we've heard that about there and the Velvet Turtle. <coughs> well, the Velvet Turtle was later, <laughs> but uh, Tommy Bowman's was there uh, much earlier than that. Um, one thing that's really changed, I think, through the years is the face of Redondo Beach along the beach. What, having lived at Avenue D, and if you were looking south and, and south to the border and then north to the pier, what was it like there? What things were there that you remember uh, in your youth from ten and below? Well, uh, looking south, uh, there were there weren't any buildings on the on the uh, on Esplanade down that way at all. The only thing down south was the Riviera Country. I guess it was called Riviera Country Club or something like that, and that was about all that was there. Up on the hill, uh, the Haggerty you could see the Haggerty Estate, which is uh, now the the uh, the church, the uh, neighborhood. neighborhood church, yeah, and uh, so you didn't see much. There weren't many buildings at that time. Now, was there anything built on the west side of the Esplanade um, in terms of houses or businesses? On the west side of the Esplanade, uh, no, no. In fact, there there really aren't an awful lot right now. But there's a series of homes that starts uh, way. Uh, you know, down after Avenue I, south of that, but uh, there weren't any. There was. I don't remember when Millie Riera's uh, restaurant that was on Esplanade there. I don't know when that was built, but it was probably built uh, in the 40s and may have been the late 30s, possible. There was a building on the an old building on the corner of. Esplanade and Avenue D on the southwest, southeast corner of that intersection that we used to call a castle. It was all, all made of concrete, and I remember it was all falling apart. There was the, the steel was expanding and rusting, and the and the concrete was popping off there. But it was a quite a massive building. Uh, I remember that. Now speaking of massive buildings, we had someone in one of the interviews that remembers a big house at about topaz or sapphire that looked like a castle. It had steeples on the top and um, it was a fairly big house on the Esplanade, probably on the west side. Do you ever remember that house or did you ever know who lived in it? No, I don't think so. Mm -mm. so don't going, recall that. On Esplanade and sapphire around, on the west side of the street? Yes. Somewhere around sapphire topaz. Don't think so. Um, that doesn't mean it wasn't there, however. <laughs> so when you were, what was the beach like? And did you ever get into surfing when you were a young man? I was not a surfer, really. Although I liked to, I liked to, liked the beach, and I body surfed, but I never body, I never surfed on a board per se, uh, like some people did. Uh, Looking at the beach today, how different is it in terms of size from 1941, say, to 1945, when you were going to the beach? 
Is it still as shallow? Was it shallow then as it is now, or was it uh, longer to get to the water? Well, it wasn't an awful lot different. Uh, there was a little more sand, I think, than there is now, uh, a little deeper sand uh, section. I remember he used to, every time he went to the beach, he had to spend 10 minutes getting the tar off your feet because uh, seepage uh, offshore uh, the, of oil you know, would combine with the sand and you'd end up with goo all over your feet. It was a mess. Don't have that now. That's a that's better now. There used to be a lot of seaweed and junk on the beach all the time. Um, don't have that now. The beaches are kept clean now. It's very nice. Um, as you go further north, of course, into the uh, into Hermosa, uh, after the boardwalk and you get into Hermosa and so forth, those beaches were really uh, extensive, and they still are quite a bit. That's pretty much the same as I remember them. Now, do you remember any of the fishing barges um, off the coast? And we heard stories about one of them coming ashore one time. Do you recall? <laughs> yeah, when they came ashore every couple of years, they'd blow in for some storm and end up on the beach, and they'd drag them back out, and they'd be there for the next year or two. Uh, <clears throat> and they lost one or so. I think they sunk one or something, but there used to be two or maybe three bar barges at one time. I used to fish on them, half-day boat, and go out and fish on the boats. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And yeah. on a pier, too. Although, And we used to get pretty good fishing on the pier, actually. Well, kind of uh, moving up to the pier. Uh, well, be right before the pier, do you remember Irons Cottage? And did you have any, as a young person, Did you uh, were you ever taken there by your parents? Irons Cottage, the... Uh, See, now I'm thinking of the restaurant, and then there's also, that was a restaurant, I believe, yeah, on the pier. There was also the Wagon Wheel restaurant, and uh, we didn't go out to restaurants much. In fact, when I was a kid, uh, I, that's a change in what people do. You know, we used to, people now go out quite a bit. We very seldom went out to eat, and there weren't that many places you had to go, uh, you know, a ways away to find uh, restaurants, generally. Uh, we didn't even have a, a grocery store. Uh, the closest grocery store to our house on the 200 block of Avenue E was on a little store, which is still there, on the corner of uh, Catalina and, Ab and Avenue A, I guess that is. Yeah, it's still there. So is that where you had to go to get meat? And mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, we'd go there, or we'd go down if we had to get some more. Or the bigger, the biggest store was at Torrance Boulevard and Pacific Coast Highway, Roberts Market, I think it was called. And then it was a big deal uh, when uh, Donlu's Market opened up on Pacific Coast Highway and Avenue F, I think it was. And that was, then we, man, it was close, you know, I could walk there. It was great. That was a fancy thing. <laughs> so when you went to uh, when you went to the pier, I mean, people today see uh, the wood pilings at the first side of the south side of the pier, and then it's concrete because it's been replaced since 1988. What was the pier like in, at your earliest remembrance of going out on the pier? Uh, I used to go. I mean, I went at least once or twice to the to the pool, to the plunge, the old saltwater heated plunge, and the pier was all behind that, so you didn't see it until you got out there, the Horseshoe Pier, which is still there, and it's just been repaired a lot. It used to be the, the straight section of the pier used to go out quite a bit further than it does now. And the, uh, but, and then the, uh, in the front down there, uh, you know, they had the, the Penny Arcade and the uh, the ballroom. What's that it's called? The Mandarin ballroom. Mandarin ballroom. Yeah, my folks used to had gone there and danced there. Yeah, I think actually they turned that into a skating rink. I think I may have I may have skated there at one time. Uh, so what do you remember about the plunge? It was impressive. It was it was huge. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's that's. I, I, I think they must have closed that. I was pretty young. I learned to swim at the Biltmore, uh, the Biltmore Plunge in Hermosa Beach. And at that time, I, by the time I was learning to swim, I don't think the plunge was even open. They closed it down. People told us about three sections in the plunge. Mm -hmm, there are three. Mm -hmm. And one of them had a fountain that kids used to sit under the Oh, yeah. yeah. There used to be a kind of a, a 
minimal, you know, kids' pool, basically, a waiting. But it was a couple feet deep, I think, or something like that. And then the deep pool at the other end where the diving platform was and everything. Yeah. Now, if you're going through the... W w there was a restaurant on the south side that was called the Hacienda. Do you on the south that? side of... They talked about fish, some fish markets. Too. Oh, there are a lot of fish markets. Well, there are two or three main ones, but, yeah, there were two or three at least. Reds? Uh, no. I'm trying to think of the name of it. I remember my uh, it was a guy who was a fighter that owned it, uh, a boxer. And my uh, my dad and he used to run around together. I've forgotten his name. You, do you remember his name? Uh, anyway, my dad used to. He was a good fighter. He he got. Uh, I just can't remember his name right now. But my dad gave up trying to box with him. He ended up giving him his gloves because he didn't want to fight him anymore. He always got beat. You know? So he, he gave those up, <laughs> gave them to him. Uh, now, what do you remember about Moonstone Beach? Moonstone? And about Moonstones. I mean, a lot of people today, if I told them... What is a Moonstone? ...collected a Moonstone, what would it look like? And what did you do with them as a kid? Well, I just collected them. You know, you, nothing you could do with them once you got them. But they were pretty. They were had probably quartz, uh, had quartz in them. And some, were, some you could uh, hold up the light and see through them. And they had a little bit of a milky color to them. Uh, and the, the ones that were, the best ones were the ones that were, uh, you could see through, you know. And uh, so you hunted around for those. those it was that was an area down by the Fox Theater that was called Moonstone Beach. Now a lot of people have told us about the old boardwalk before it was taken out by the storms. Do you remember the boardwalk and what can you tell us about the boardwalk between what's now Diamond Street and Hermosa Beach? Very little. I've, I don't recall that much about it. Just that it was a uh, it was all along there. I mean, you could just stroll along. It was nice and wide and plenty of room to walk along there. You did. Uh, but I don't remember that much about it. So, uh, do you, at the time when you were growing up, do you remember the salt um, behind where the Edison plant is now? There used to be a, like a salt lagoon. Yeah, the Salt Lake. We call did, it, yeah. Now, did you ever go there as a child? Oh yeah, I think so. Uh, it was always there, and it was always kind of a mess. There was a bunch of junk in it all the time. But uh, it was created, I guess, when the Edison Company first built their Edison plant there for some reason they, they dug that out or maybe it was a natural thing that's possible but um, when we <clears throat> when we became uh, when I got into Indian guys with my son we had to decide who what our Indian tribe was going to be so we became the Yang Naus which is a native Indian group of the Redondo Beach we did a little study had the kids do some study on it and uh, and that's how they how they made their living. They'd sold salt. They'd dry that. It was pretty salty, and it did. Brian had gotten even, you know, more concentrated over the years, and they would sell the salt to the other Indian tribes. Apparently, that's how they would trade for things. But we didn't decide. We decided not to dress like they did, because they didn't wear any clothes. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> so that was quite a bit of discussion at the uh, Indian guide troop that night. <laughs> so when. Uh uh, when you were young, and you talked about there being so few houses there, who is your, I'm just going to ask, who was your best friend, and where did they live that you had to go see them if you wanted to go play with them? Do you remember anything like that, that you had to go? No, you, you, you played pretty much in your own area. I mean, you know, somebody within a block or two. I don't think we used to go any further than that. There was a couple, three kids that lived on our block. We played baseball on the street and in our bare feet and those great big rocks. I don't know how, he, how we ever did that. Tore the, our baseball would last three or four days. Then it would just you know be all string. We'd have to tape it up again. You know, It was a mess. But, but we used to play baseball on the street on Avenue D there and, and in our bare feet. And I, gosh, I can't believe that, but we did it. <laughs> so it, looking at Avenue D today and Avenue D, E, and F, there's a lot of palm trees there that were planted on those streets. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, you know, people don't ever remember seeing them differently, but were, do you remember when they were planted or were those people? Oh, no, there? they were there when I was a kid. I'd, I mean, as, far, as long as I can remember, there were palm trees there. I don't know when they were planted, but my guess is they were planted when they developed those avenues. Uh, 
but I don't know when they were planted. But they've been replaced uh, two or three times in my lifetime. So uh, there's many of them still there, but uh, none of the originals probably. So going eastbound from Avenue D, uh, we've heard that Pacific Coast Highway wasn't named that. It was named Elena um, mm -hmm. uh, for a while. And then what was east of Pacific Coast Highway on the avenues? Not much. Uh, there were some people that grew flowers up on those sand dunes. It made them it was sand dunes is what they were primarily. And so there were some uh, some flower carnations grown in there, um, but not much of anything else. The street, I don't even think Prospect was cut through at all. Uh, they're just, you know, it was it was uh, pretty much open space. Now, do you remember any of the dairies that were around the dairies and pig farms we've heard about that were in the Yeah. Uh, Norma's parents, uh, or Norma's grandparents, actually, uh, lived out at what is now Anza and Spencer, which Emerald. Emerald, yeah, Emerald, and on the north east corner of Anza and Emerald, they had a. There were a number of sections of land. They were like most of them were five acre sections, and there were uh, there were uh, uh, dairies out in that area. In fact, Norma used to tell me about. As a kid, listening to, listening to, in the morning, listening to the uh, people that were from, I guess they were from Switzerland. Switzerland. They were yodeling in the morning while they were milking the cows. You know, so that you wouldn't think of that in here around this part of the country, but that was the way it was. So there were quite a few uh, dairies uh, in that area. Now, living in South Redondo, did you ever have any reason, or did you ever go up to what's now North Redondo? north of 190th Street between here and, say, Manhattan Beach Boulevard? Uh, not really. Um, the only reason I went up north that way was my dad was working, of course, at Pacific Crest Cemetery, which was kind of out in the Tule's too. But uh, you'd go out, you'd have to go to uh, Burrell Street and go up Burrell. That was the only street that went straight on out to Inglewood Avenue. And of course, this was now Macadam. I'm just oiled roads and make and turn left on Inglewood. What was Inglewood is now Inglewood Avenue. And uh, right there at that corner, at the corner of 190th and or not, not yeah, I guess it is 190th and Inglewood Avenue on the northwest corner was a. Fireworks factory. Owned by the Lisa family. I don't know who it was owned by, but it, I remember it blew up one morning, or something. There was a big explosion, and it blew, I mean, it blew people's windows out around. It was a heck of an explosion. Even from there to Pacific Crest Cemetery is 18, well, let's see, Pacific Crest on the corner of 182nd, so that's. Uh, Ten blocks away or so, the mausoleum building, the windows were blown out in it from that explosion. So it must have been a not not blown out, but warped. These were glass, glass, uh, stained glass windows, and they were warped because of that explosion. Now, uh, your dad, you had said that your dad started um, digging graves in 1933. That's correct. How did he get into that? It was obviously three years before your life, but he ever talked to you about how he got into into grave digging? Uh, you no, know, he didn't. I don't know how he had. He probably was looking around for a job, and that's where he got one. You know, <laughs> that's what happens. You know, circumstance. Uh, after he started that, uh, he, he had before that actually he had worked in for the mortuary business a little bit. So maybe that's how it happened, because he was a. Uh, uh, he did contract uh, embalming work for a lot of the mortuaries in the area, Stone and Myers and Tor or Stone Mar Stone Marchers, Stone. It was Myers Mortuary at that point, and some of the others in the area. So that's how he got started in the business of the mortuary cemetery business, I guess. And uh, what was his? Uh, did he eventually? I, I think that the cemetery now is within your family. Or it's uh, you're actually managers or owners of. The yes, that's correct. Uh -huh. And yeah. what year did your family first start managing or owning? Uh, well, my dad 
I had an opportunity to buy some stock from the then manager in about 1940 or so. And borrowed some money from my uncle and got some stock. And then uh, in 19, about 80, somewhere around in there, we were able to buy the stock that was owned by the uh, Baptist Church. Uh, and so then we acquired the whole thing at that point. What it said, uh, we have some notes here that when someone spoke with you, um, the cemetery uh, opened in 1902? 1902. Mm -hmm. Now, were, were there other cemeteries in Redondo Beach at the time beside that one? Well, prior to that time, there was kind of a Boot Hill Cemetery uh, on the top of Knob Hill, uh, probably the three or 400 block would be where it peaks up there. There was kind of the old Western kind of style of Boot Hill Cemetery. Um, and there were a lot of Indian burials there, and a lot of the earlier settlers in the area were buried there. And um, and then when Pacific Crest opened, which used to, which originally was called Redondo Cemetery, um, they moved what what graves they could locate and identify to the to Pacific Crest Cemetery. And in fact, we even moved a few. When the Greek Orthodox Church was ex was uh, excavated, um, I don't know when that was. That was probably in the 60s sometime. We moved a few more that we were able to identify and took them to the Pacific Crest for interment. Now, are the headstones or any of the things that marked the graves there in the Boot Hill Cemetery, were those moved also out to Pacific Crest? And are they in a specific area? <coughs> in a, the in a section there, uh, some of the <coughs> markers were, there's some of them still there. Uh, mo many of the graves were, weren't able to identify who they were, you know, who the, who the person, who the deceased was. But there were a few that were marked, and, and the markers are at Pacific Crest Cemetery. Now, in the notes that we have, um, I mean, people that have always lived in Redondo Beach of uh, the White and Day Mortuary on the corner of Torrance and Prospect is a landmark. Mm -hmm. It's a landmark in that it's probably something that everybody drives by quite a bit. And um, who was the partner? Who was White as part of White and Day? Laydale White was the mortuary. He had a mortuary in Hermosa Beach on, a, on Pier Avenue and Loma Drive. And... Uh, <clears throat> my dad kind of pooled his resources, the stock that he had at Pacific Crest with Glade White's stock that he, well, not stock, but the, he owned the mortuary in Hermosa and one in Manhattan Beach at the time. And that's how White and Day got started in 1946. And they built the mortuary on Prospect in Torrance Boulevard the next year. In 1946 or 47? 47, 46, I think it was completed in 47, yeah. Now, how was it decided to have the southern, it looks like a southern mansion uh, with the large pillars. Uh, do you know who decided uh, on the design? I think my dad drove by what was then a Flanagan, a Harden Flanagan Mortuary in Inglewood, across from the f current now, what is the Forum on Prairie Avenue, and they had built a, uh, a colonial-style building. He thought it would really look nice, so that's when he got the idea for the colonial, using that colonial style architecture. And of course, at the time, out in front of that was a big kind of a, a grassy knoll, kind of a sweeping knoll, and down to the sidewalk, and then there were a bunch of magnolia trees, which the city, in their wisdom, decided to uh, take out when they widened Torrance Boulevard. It was, it was really pretty, and it just ruined the front look of the look of, a, of the colonial mortuary, but that's progress for you, you know. Well, can you, <laughs> can you describe Torrance? One of the things that we've heard about, some of the things we've heard about are uh, the bridge, at Prospect Bridge at Del Amo, where the red cars Red cars went under, that's correct. And uh, so what was the, the area around Torrance and Prospect like in 1946 when your father first... 46, 47, when they first built Well, it was a, Torrance Boulevard was a two-lane road. Prospect was a two-lane road. <clears throat> they were paved, but uh, not hardly any traffic. Uh, it was just, you know, there were, in 1946, there were probably 20% of the people lived in the area that, that do now, is my guess. So, you know, it was just a different time, a different uh, pace, uh, 
I don't even know whether, I don't recall if there was even a signal on Prospect and Taurus. It was probably a, it was a stop sign, you know. So. Um, what do you remember about the red cars as a young person? And did you ever ride to them to Los Angeles or did you take them mm -hmm. to other parts? My grandmother, she, she, this is my mother's mother, used to take me on a lot of firsts, you know, like first time in a bus, first time in a train, the first time in a, in the red car. Yeah, and we, we could catch it right down, you know, by our house and you could go all the way to L.A. Now, do you remember the path that you took that it would take to get there? No. Well, I mean, you know, I, I know how it went there because afterwards, but uh, yeah, we used to go, it'd go down through Redondo and follow the, the uh, more or less Pacific Avenue, go across the street and up the hill and, and go through that where Redondo High School is, you know, and up through that uh, bridge that was there and on out. And I think it went down to Hawthorne. It went down by Pacific Crest Cemetery, actually. There used to be a, a depot right north of the cemetery, or east of the cemetery, right across from the railroad tracks. That was the the red car line went in through there, and then went on to Hawthorne and down Hawthorne Boulevard. I don't recall where it went from Hawth Hawthorne Boulevard to get into L.A. I, I only I think it probably only took that trip one time. So now. Uh what year did you go to middle school and did you go to central school? I went to south school, which is K through 6, uh, from 1941 to 47 or so. Uh, they said maybe departmental? Then, it was, yeah, then, then to, from there to uh, central school. Which was on pro which was on yeah Prospect and uh, not Prospect Pacific Coast Highway and Emerald and Emerald yeah and there to Redondo High School. So yeah. what year did you start uh, high school at Redondo? Fifty, nineteen fifty. Graduated in fifty four. So what did the high school kid of the age do at at Redondo? What was the fun thing to do, and what were the things that you did? You I was play in sports or do any? No, I wasn't activity? much involved in sports. I was more involved in the choral the choral program, music, um, and uh, I was pretty much involved with the uh, at the Methodist Church in terms of social stuff. Uh, that's where I went, met. Well, actually, I probably met Norma before that. Probably she was, she went to South School too, so I probably knew her there too. I. Well, we waited until we got to high school before we dated, anyway. So, <laughs> so what was high school like? What, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the size of the school, the buildings that were there at the time? Oh yeah, there was. Let's see, the Lincoln Lincoln Building, which is no longer there, it was declared. Uh, it was. Uh, they had to. They had to tear it down because of some ruling. I think the multiple stories weren't allowed for schools after the 1933 earthquake and. So they had to tear it down, and and here here it here it was. It, it they almost couldn't tear it down. It was a it was it was a massive steel concrete structure that it was condemned, but it was the only building that was also uh, rated for an air raid shelter for the <laughs> at the time. You know, <laughs> really nuts stuff. But so that was there. A couple of the buildings are still there. The science building is still there. That's at the corner of Diamond and. Uh, Francisca. That's right. Mm -hmm. The science building is there. The girls' gym is no longer there. That's the, we're we're in that location right now. The city hall or Redondo is at the location of where the girls' gym used to be. Now, did you have to cross the street from yeah. one part of the school to the other side? How, how big was Pacific Coast Highway at the time, or Elena? If, if that was. I the don't recall. I don't think it. It may have been four lanes, but uh, it was no more than four lanes, and more likely it was two at that time. But of course, you know, I don't really recall whether there was a, there probably was a signal uh, in 1950s. There was signals there, yeah. Now, did the red car pass along the side of the school to go up to Del Amo? Uh, I believe so, if I recall correctly. Yeah, I think so. Went right up there and then through that, under that bridge. Um, you said you were involved in the music program. Uh, what type of activities did the choral groups do? And, and uh, do you remember any of the teachers or the people that were involved? Well, there was uh, really 
don't. Meisenheimer was a few years after I was there. I've forgotten who the teacher was. It may have been him. I don't remember his. Do you remember the teacher's name? No, but I, he came later. He came in later, think, yeah. But <clears throat> we, 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 every once in a week, we took a tour to University of Pacific one time, I remember. It was a big thing. And, uh, uh, we sang at various groups here and there, you know. So, so by the time you were 16 or 17, at that, uh, when you were growing up, what year would you have gotten a car? And did you have a car that you, uh, do you remember your first car? Yeah, a 1932 Ford two-door Cabriolet. Roll-up windows it had. <laughs> that was special. But that was, it was an old car when I got it. I mean, I, I bought it from a lady who had it up on blocks in North Redondo, paid $40 for it, got a heck of a deal. Three years later, I sold it for 80 and thought I'd really done a deal, you know. I sure wish I had it now. <laughs> now did you build that car yourself? Oh, no, 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 no. It was a Model A with a rumble seat and so forth. And I drove it to high school a couple of years before I had a license, even. In those days, there wasn't much traffic. I'd go by and get Norma. And we'd drive to, you know. I, and nowadays, I would I'd never think of telling my kids, you know, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. Well, in those days... There wasn't much traffic. Everybody was careful. Everybody knew everybody in town, you know. Police officers probably knew I didn't have a license. You know, as long as I didn't run into anything or do something wrong, I so, was okay. So how would you get a license back then? Was there a Department of Motor Vehicles, or did you go to the local police? Well, uh, yeah. I remember you used to be able to get a license when you were 14, and about six months before that, I was 14, they changed it to 16, and I thought my world came to an end. It was terrible. But I think it was uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles. I think I'm sure it was. Yeah, but it was, and it was in Torrance, if I recall correctly. It still is, I guess. Uh, but that's where the office was. Yeah. So when you got that car, where would you go? Uh, where would you go? Where would you take Norma in the car? In well, what, what mainly, you know, you couldn't just tear off everywhere. But you could, you know, we would, uh, we would go to and from. School primarily was what that Model A did. And then, of course, once I got my license, and I was able to use my parents' cars and so forth. And then, yeah, we used to go up in the in the Palisades Hills every once in a while and watch the submarine races and that sort of thing. You know, <laughs> there was not much up there in Palisades. There really wasn't. So, what would you do up there? Oh, we neck. <laughs> you want me to go into detail? <laughs> sure. Let, let's see if necking was different in 1950, I 1953. Have no, I have no idea what necking is. I think it may be a little different than it used to be. I'm sure it is, in fact. So what was it like? Was there a Hawthorne Boulevard that went up into Palace Rudy's? And what was it like coming down that in a 1932 Ford? Well, 19, you know, we Hawthorne went through... Don't recall. We used to go up Palace Verde's Boulevard, and that's how we get up there. Palace Verde's Boulevard and swing around, and go by the by the uh, plaza area, and uh, and there just wasn't much up in Palace Verde. You could you could we used to go hunting in Palace Verde's. I mean, my my, my grandfather take me up there. I take my twenty two up there, and we'd go target practice or hunting for anything that moves, skunks and. Birds and whatever, you know. Now, did you hunt for anything to eat? <laughs> no, not quite. No, no. So you just went vermin hunting. Just went, just went target shooting. So basically. about what what year do you think it uh, that it people were up there where you had to stop going hunting? Well, I probably went up there and shot shot the twenty two and so forth. Probably until at least the first or second year of high school. Early 50s, late, probably early 50s, real early 50s. So uh, taking a step back, I think your family is probably one of the oldest in Redondo that's still here. Um, I'm not sure, but I know they've been around a long time, yeah. So uh, we, we ask about some of the personages, the people that, are, that people remember, and in the notes someone had asked you about Fifi Maloof. What, oh, what, Fifi. Oh, yeah. you yeah, but you've got all sorts of stories about her, you know. Most of which I remember from hearsay only, of course. So what but, were they in hearsay? We hear that we hear that she was a very good woman and very charitable to a lot of people. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, she 
she was very supportive of community things, and uh, she was always sitting there at the city council meeting in her in her fur coat, you know, and uh, and uh, she was kind of a character, you know. She was. I remember the time we saw her on Channel Five, and what was the guy's name? Dick Lane. Dick Lane, yeah. Was asking her, you know, sure. Her this was during one of the storms, and one of the first storms that started was battering her home. She had a home on, uh, right on the strand there, and uh, had a house there actually, <laughs> a home too, I guess. And uh, uh, Dick Lane was interviewing her and telling her about, you know, that she was saying, "Well, she wanted all her sailor friends to know that she saved their clothes from getting all wet, and she saved their things, and don't worry about them that when they got back that." their clothing and personal effects and everything would still be there and Dick Lane would didn't he had he apparently didn't have a clue as to what her profession was <laughs> now do you remember uh, it, it, what years would Fifi Maloof's um, business would have what, what where, when was it in place do you remember no I really don't heard stories uh, and she was there probably until the early 50s uh, and she had a or, cafe the yeah, front, front side was yeah, um, it was a cafe. I think so. Yeah, I don't really remember much of it other than hearsay. What uh, probably most of which I've learned af after the fact uh, and heard stories and so forth. But uh, what do you remember about her car? Big black thing. Big black car. Big black. I don't remember if it was a Packard, maybe. Don't remember the make, actually. Now, I've heard stories about her taking her mother to Mass at St. James. Every oh, she's very her. active at St. James, yeah. Very supportive, yeah. And something yeah. about carrying money in her stockings? I had heard that. I had never seen it, but I would heard that. Yeah, I heard most of these stories I would heard about. Uh, the one the one that I recall that was really funny was uh, the, when during a council meeting, apparently, uh, when all this trouble was with the, with the storm, the mayor asked... Uh, Ask her, you know, how well how are you getting in and out of your house now? And, and, and Phoebe said, same way you do, Mayor, right through that back door. You know? <laughs> I think that was, well, I won't say that. <laughs> I don't know what mayor that was. I don't know. I, I think that was probably, I don't know what mayor it was. It was in the late 40s or early 50s sometime. Um, so you graduated from high school around 1954. 54, yeah. We and, don't know. Uh, a question, where did you have, did you go to the prom with Norma? Sure did. First date was the co-ed ball when she was a freshman and I was a sophomore. The girl's supposed to ask the guys to the co-ed ball. It was a reverse thing. I didn't let that happen, though. I didn't want her to get away, so I, I asked her, and she said yes, and the rest is history. <laughs> and so by the time you were a senior, where was the prom that year? Uh, well, they usually had the proms at school. They were in the gym, at the Redondo, at the boys' gym. And, uh, in fact, I don't think they were ever anywhere else that I recall. Was the canteen in place when you were a high school student for the dances? The canteen. They uh, had something called the canteen that was um, near the current cafeteria, or it may have been the Well, canteen. that's what it was. It was a cafeteria. <laughs> that's, I mean, uh, well, we, you know, we, we had, the ball was always in the boys' gym. Was nowhere anywhere else, was it? No, uh -uh. I don't think we had, uh, they may have called it the canteen when they had a dance in it, I don't know, but that, that's what it was. It was a boys' gym. And but, is that the boys' gym that they have today? No. Well, uh, it's in the same place, and probably some of the building is the same, but the wonderful floor we had in the hardwood floor that was built on springs and so forth, it was a wonderful floor. That's all gone, but... Uh, and then, of course, they put a pool in there, too. And so I, I don't know whether any of the building is left. Probably not. Maybe some foundation or something, but it's a new building. And the girls' gym was built, the new one, probably while we were at school, I think, in the early 50s. So you left school, and how long did it take for you to get married after high school? We were married in August 10th, 1957. And so what, so were you three doing? Years. what were you doing so, for those three uh, years after high school? Well, three years I was going to school, and Norma was going to school, and then she went to, to, to Cal, and I went to Stanford, and then Redlands, and Stanford, and then I, but I never did finish. And uh, 
and then we got married, and I started working actually at Pacific Crest, just like my dad did. I, well, actually, I started my schooling was was in accounting and business, so I I took a job for Hughes Tool Company, which is the parent company for Hughes Oil or Hughes Aircraft, I mean, and uh, worked there for about eight months until I found out I didn't want to be an accountant, and uh, then went out to Pacific Crest Cemetery and uh, worked there for a while as assistant manager and then manager. Then when my dad retired in 1971, took over the White and Day mortuaries and the cemetery accommodation. So. Now, going back to Hughes, when we started today, I asked you a little bit about uh, seeing the spruce goose. Oh, yes. What, what year was that, and what were you doing when you saw the spruce goose being taken down to Long Beach? We were in... I don't know really what year it was exactly, except I know I was at South School, and <clears throat> it was such a big deal that they let us out of class, and we all plastered ourselves up against the chain link fence on the east side of the, uh, still there actually, uh, probably the same chain link fence actually, uh, of the uh, 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 playground, and were able to watch these big trucks go by with pieces of the spruce goose, huge thing. It was really massive and really impressive. I mean, it was a big thing, and we stayed out there for, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes. They had it all timed so that we could see what uh, pieces of the wing, pieces of the wings in the tail structure, and you know, all the fuselage parts. It was quite, uh, quite something. So, talking about historical things, what are, is there any? Are there famous people or famous things that you remember happening in Redondo Beach at any time that are really set aside for you? Hmm. You know, I just, uh, I, I don't recall anything specific other than, I mean, that one was a, was a impressive because I was always interested in flying and I became a pilot and uh, so I have a, pilot's license and the instrument rating and twin engine rating and stuff, so I enjoyed that. But I've always enjoyed aeronautical stuff, and so that particular thing was really of interest to me, even at that age. Uh, I don't recall... Uh, I'm sure there were many things, I just don't recall any right off the, off the bat. Well, so speaking of flying, um, some of the older people, people older than yourself that we've talked to, um, had gone to Mines Field either to watch air races mm -hmm. or to see the Graf Zeppelin when it came. Uh, do you remember anything about, did your parents ever take you to Los Angeles to Mines Field or? Uh, I think I went to Mines Field once for an air show one time. What do you remember about the air show? But, uh, but uh, it's so vague in my mind that it, I must have been very young. I must have been, it must have been probably just two or three years old or something. Because I don't remember, I remember some airplanes, but I, very big recollection. So somewhere around, say, 1959 or 1960, is that when you started in the funeral business in Redondo? Yeah, 1959, yeah. I, and, uh, and then when my dad retired, I uh, managed the mortuaries. Then we acquired the Rice Mortuary in 85, and now in the last couple of years, we've acquired four of the McCormick mortuaries, so we have a number of other mortuaries now, too. So in the time... Um, that's not a business that too many people are familiar with, but uh, what were the mortuaries in Redondo Beach as, uh, for say, from 1960 uh, to um, a given time? Were there a, were there certain groups of people that you um, that were your your customers uh, that may have gone to you rather than to Torrance? How did that? <coughs> how did the business develop here in the Well, South? it was it, it developed a lot of personal involvement. I mean, it used to be that. Uh, the people that were in the mortuary field would work would 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 actually be involved in the community a lot, like my dad was, uh, and you know I have been. And uh, but uh, uh, you had, even though it was a small town, you may have had two or three different mortuaries, and each mortuary would kind of be a kind of a specialist for a particular kind of group of people. I mean, it used to be. Um, maybe this particular mortuary primarily had Catholic clientele. This particular mortuary primarily had Protestant clientele. 
another mortuary would maybe have uh, used to be a couple mortuaries in uh, Los Angeles that were had the Japanese business, uh, and <clears throat> that's changed over the years. So that pretty much do you know you have to be uh, know the the uh, different mores of the various uh, religions and so forth, so you can serve all families. But that's kind of how it started. Yeah. Now. I, the White and Day name is has been, I think, more prominent than others in Redondo Beach. Have you had relationships with families here for generations? Uh, I mean, have you sensed that as in the time that you've worked from 1960 to 2005? Oh yes. In fact, we you know we do studies to see why people come to us as opposed to going somewhere else. You know, and the primary reason for people coming to our firm now is because we have served a member of their family before. That and um, uh, convenience, that's why you used to have a little mortuary in each city you know, instead of having one big mortuary in a big area. Uh, and that's still true. Uh, but we've served, I'm sure, three, four generations of families uh, over the years, yeah. Now, can you tell us that um, many people, when they go on vacations, actually go to cemeteries and walk through cemeteries uh, from time to time. What is there about Pacific Crest that makes it different from other places? And are, is there anything there that uh, is uh, phenomenal in terms of old graves or markers or things that people would go to look at? Well, you know, any anybody who wants to do a study of some area, they just walk through a cemetery, look at the markers to see if they have some relatives or friends or famous people or whatever. Pacific Crest uh, started in 1902, and of course that's old for this area. Um, but um, and uh, there are, uh, I'm sure there are sure some some significant folks in terms of uh, uh, well-known people that are buried there, of course. Uh, but um, I remember looking through some of the some of the. Uh, cards. Uh, we used to have three by five cards that we'd put the information down uh, as to where a person was buried and that sort of thing. I remember looking through that and remember remarking that uh, to, that to Norma that there were many uh, young kids that died of, uh, of tuberculosis and, and measles and mumps and whooping cough and things like that. You know that we have them now, but people get a little sick. But in those days, they died from them, many of the kids. And then we just had a lot of young people, really young kids. I mean, from a month or two or three months old to a year or two that we had a lot of them. And of course, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, now, are there any famous people? You mentioned that there might be some famous there, there people. There are. Uh, I. Uh, I, I, I remember we had uh, uh, Robert P Bob Peterson work for for us for a while, and he, he did some research, and we found some. But I I can't recall who those folks were, but there were a number of them. Now, do you have movie stars from the early age of movies? Uh, there was one. I think some Powell, somebody Powell, uh, one of the Powells. I uh, she was a dancer. I forgot what her first name was. Now, are there any interesting stories um, about, I know a lot of people talk, uh, I'm a policeman, they talk about police humor. Uh, without betraying confidentiality, is there any mortuary humor or any uh, cemetery humor of things that happened that were really out of the ordinary? Oh, yeah. The years? Well, see, this is, uh, the, we had one that you're probably thinking about or maybe you've heard about. We, I remember at one time we had a, we had a, uh, well, I think it was a guy from the FBI came out and talked to me. He says, uh, did you have a burial of so-and-so here? And I said, yes. And we looked it up. Yes, he's buried here. And he says, here, would you show me the grave? And I showed him, went out and showed him the grave. And he said, um, well, he's not here. And I said, oh, yes, he is. He's <laughs> right there. You know? And this guy, he said, well, I don't think so. And I said, well, look, I remember that particular situation because it was a little unusual in circumstances of the death. So I said, I was happened to be here, and I remember them putting the casket in the vault, and the vault was lowered in the grave. So I know he's there. He says, I don't think he is. <laughs> and I said, yes, he is. <laughs> and he said, well, we're going to have to, we're going to have to, you know, dig up that vault to make sure. 
And I said, well, you know, I'm not going to do that unless I get a court order. I figured that'd be the last I saw him, you know. The next day he comes in with a court order. <laughs> and we dug that up. And the vault was there. And we took the lid off the vault. And it was empty. Do you know who he was? The deceased? Yes. Yes. Or the deceased that wasn't there? The deceased that wasn't there. I don't recall the name right now. But yes, we knew who he was. We had, I mean, we, we had all the records and where the funeral was held by in Torrance and so forth. So we had all those records. But apparently what happened uh, is that the, the person that killed this person decided he wanted to have him with him. Now I remember. Do you remember that? <laughs> yes. And so he, he apparently hired some of our people on the sly at night to go and dig that up and then replace the pre place the lid on the vault and put the sod back so it appeared that there was no, didn't do anything, you know. And he spent some years in the wall. Yes, yeah, 